Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Moon. The Garage Gym Athlete Podcast is a result of my desire to build better humans, unequivocal coaches, and autonomous athletes. I've spent the last several years obsessing over program design, nutrition, and every other way you can optimize human performance. This podcast distills the latest scientific research with what I've learned and blends it with the not-so-scientific field of mental toughness. We are here to build you into a dangerously effective athlete. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find out more about our training at garagegymathlete.com. And if you want to pursue more into the field of coaching and programming, head to endof3fitness.com. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jared Moon here with most of the crew. Only Marco is not here. So we have Joe Courtney, Ashley Hicks, Kyle Shrum, and VD. How's everyone doing? Hicks. Wunderbar. Great. Joe, we're all dying to hear your updates from the future. So let's just get right to it. I don't think I have anything that yeah, special. Tell us what's just... the, what the future's like. It's hot. Heat, heat is coming. <laughs> the future is hot. <laughs> the opposite of winter is coming. But I am back in the gym, back to doing, as of today, the first three days in strength. So that feels good. And nice. I posted a picture on my story that uh, was the first time that a barbell has touched my back in many months, and it left a bruise. So I bruised like a peach because it's just not used to barbells touching it. But it feels good. I was surprised that... I wasn't very sore after the squat day, but I also, I'm like 90, 95% able to complete all workouts in the hotel gym. There's a barbell, but not a rack. So I had to- Not a what? A rack. Wow. It's so so every bench. squat starts with a clean? Yep. True, so one I man, was, one barbell. I, nice. I was cleaning and putting the, the, the weight onto my back. So that was like the, uh, the limiting factor weight-wise, but I just added a rep and added a second onto the tempo. Dude, I don't remember who it was, but he used two trash cans as his squat rack. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you can get creative. I think it was like one of our first couple of athlete interviews. That was, he had a barbell and some weights, and you, he had two trash cans that he used as his squat stands. I don't know how the hotel personnel are going to feel about me either dragging trash cans or something. Into they the won't gym. know. No? Well, no, they do it low because there's actually somebody that signs you in when you go in. Oh. It's like a legit gym. Oh, my <laughs> like goodness. A, like a fancy hotel. It's a very fancy hotel. It's basically <laughs> like a resort. Just saying. Not fancy enough for a squat rack, though. No, nope, not fancy enough for a squat rack. That's okay. The female's gym, because this one is segregated gym. Uh, female's gym doesn't even have a barbell. So what? it doesn't get to use a barbell. Yeah. The gym is segregated? It's- it is like completely around the corner on the other side. <laughs> so like Liz and I can't work out together. So the future is would. segregated. The future is segregated. The future Man. discriminates. And it's nice. I mean, it's different. It's but like the mom's gym. Did you, did you say it's mm. nice? I mean, different. <laughs> I, no, I didn't say that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I do pretty much have the place to myself. There's like two old guys that come in and get on the ellipticals and they just kind of talk and I just do things. Well, women aren't supposed to do strength training, right? No, they're not. <laughs> You're okay. going to get fought. Uh, yeah. How do yeah. I boot <laughs> off the call, Kyle, here? <laughs> we are house hunting now, too. Or unless you want to talk, keep talking about my gym. And the future. No, dude. I'm, your updates are your updates. Yeah. Uh, started house hunting, going through all that stuff. It's pretty fun, pretty exciting. Seen some cool places, seen some weird places. But we have a couple of weeks to do it, and so we're just enjoying that. And cooking and nutrition is kind of a, a struggle because the hotel – We have a kitchen in our hotel, but it's like one pot, one pan. They give you knives, but no cutting board. So I'm using like a piece of cardboard thing cover as my cutting board. And why don't you just use your kitchen surface? Because that's terrible for knives and kitchen surfaces. You know what? Let let the people who actually talk chime in. (laughs) (laughs) You mean who actually cook? Yeah, yeah, Yeah. who actually cook. That's what I meant. (laughs) Yeah, but pretty sure cardboard is bad on knives too, though, isn't it? It at least cushions it. And uh, so th- this isn't like actual, like traditional cardboard that you're thinking of. It's like they, they're oh, to go between their lids. Cardboard? Yeah, Bahrainian cardboard. It's, it's special, <laughs> unique. Uh, it's like uh, what they do for their uh, aluminum containers, but there's like, they're like metal on one side and then uh, it's like cardboard. Oh, I know what you're so, talking about. I know yeah, so, th- so they don't actually like cut into it. Man, why does this chicken taste like paper? 
Yeah, right. <laughs> Fiber. Yeah, that's my big updates. Love it. Ashley, how's life? Life is good. It's actually going to get cool in the future here. So you you lied about the heat. It's There's a cool front coming this way, and it's going to be like 54 tomorrow. So I'm super excited about that in the morning. I guess um, we got it first because that's my today. It's, yeah, it's me 50, too. 50 degrees outside right now, which mm. is awesome. Well, it doesn't get to be 50 degrees in Florida quite ever, so I'm very excited about this. Yeah, that's true. My windows will be open. Yeah, so I got new running shoes. And I love them. Apparently, they give me wings. And according to the pace master, Joe, I need to work on my pacing as of today's harder to kill workout. So that's that's my update. I have a really funny, absurd related story. <laughs> Please I'm gonna share. Kinda, I'm going to kind of dime somebody out, but I won't do them by name. Somebody in my family, long time ago, got, you remember, this shoe's called PF Flyers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they were jumping on their bed with them, thinking that it could make them, you know, float, fly something, and they oh, jumped no. off their bed and like broke their arm or something. That's, That's... pretty common. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jumping on the bed with shoes on and breaking your arm is common. <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna jump on the on the bed, live life to the fullest. So, PF flyers don't make you fly. They don't give you wings. You're gonna fly. You gotta break some bones. Only Red Bull does. All right, was that everything, Ashley? Yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, cool. Kyle, how you doing? Good. Finally back. Also, big update. I feel like I need a drum roll. New don't, office don't. space here at the house. It's huge. I have an official place for everything. I haven't shown you guys either because I've been saving it for the podcast. Wait, so that's why we can't see your squat rack. Right. Or you you There's inside no of your rack. squat rack. I should and say. just just so everyone um, knows, like listening to the podcast, we basically try not to talk to each other for a week. <laughs> and anytime someone starts sharing some sort of detail about their life, everyone on Slack is like, "Shut the hell up, save for the podcast." <laughs> so you guys listening get just as much of an update on everyone's life as we do as a team, because the podcast has worked us into some sort of backwards. Don't talk about anything personal until we're recording it. But yeah, so now he has he has a surprise he's going to share on on the podcast. So I've got a I've got a brand new desk, L shaped standing slash sitting desk. It's motorized. I have it programmed where I can hit a button and it stands up for me. I can Which hit another button and get? it sits down. For me. I don't remember. It's in my Amazon orders. I can share it with you later. But so that's really cool. I have an official office chair. Does it go up high um, enough got, and low enough so you can have a standing desk height, but a really high chair just in case you want to sit high? I haven't tested that. So that might be, that might be setting number three. Setting number three is not used yet. So oh, yeah. all you have to do is make a platform like VD's uh, plate jump platform. Just put some plates and some t- dumbbells and some two by fours and put your chair on top of that. See, then we get, back into, we get back into what I was doing earlier, which was a piece of plywood on my squat stands over here on the rack. So yeah. I like having the button where it just does it for it. I used yeah. my reverse hyper as a desk for like eight months. Yeah. I mean, it's so, big enough. <laughs> yeah, it's massive. It's a very expensive <laughs> desk. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good stuff. Official office space. Feels really good. I got my gym back. I don't have a whole bunch of stuff sitting in my gym. That I was. Do you have a, do you have a red waiting. stapler? Or did somebody a red take stapler. It? I don't have a stapler. I don't <gasps> really. Office staple space? things. Yeah, somebody got it. <laughs> uh, I got it too. I just don't like to admit when I do get <laughs> pop culture references, gotcha. but that's not really pop culture anymore. I didn't get that one, so that one went over my head. Okay. No, but well, anyway, well. cool official office stuff. Awesome, VD. Good morning. No real updates for me. Evening. Yeah, evening, Jill. No real updates for me, just training. But the biggest thing I guess I have is this week I start the flying phase of training. So I may miss next week's podcast, but I will do my best to be there. But super excited to do that. And it is actually cold here, just like in Dallas. So it was 42 degrees this morning. Nice. So we got some cold weather emerging. Hot lanes. Yeah. So that was pretty nice. It kind of sucks training in the heat. But yeah, two very simple, nice, neat updates. All right. That leaves me. I don't have a a lot of updates 
either. I was going to update my mile time because the previous podcast, I'd only done my back squat. So I'm, I'm going for this 500 pound back squat, five minute mile. And I did a 545, which was a one second slower than VD. And I'm very, I was oh, very actually upset about more it. updates then. Okay. Well, let's go back to you and then, <laughs> then we can come back to me. Well, I'm just kidding. Go for it. So anyway, normally if I have a goal, like you just, you just dangled the carrot right in front of me. You were like, I ran a 544. Good luck. And I'm like, all right, well, that's going to be beat. And so I went into it and I was looking at my Garmin pacing and everything. And I decided just to kind of go all out at the last 200 and I stopped looking at my watch. And that was the biggest mistake of my life (laughs) because if I would have continued to watch look at my watch, I would have ran just that much faster to beat VD by one second or at, at least time. But I decided to stop looking at my watch and just go faster. And it cost me the win. So VD, you can officially run a mile faster than me. Asterisk cycle. currently. Un- until yeah. next week. <laughs> this cycle. Uh, so yeah, that's 545 is my starting point and 410 pound back squat officially for now let's just see what happens. Then that's my only update. I also had a, a Garmin malfunction. I finally got to experience the crappiness of the, <clears throat> the wrist monitor. So Joe and Marco are Garmin users and they confirmed that if you're not actually like doing an activity, like if you're like on a bike erg or strength training, it's a little bit more erratic. And I did at the end of fit week, I did like a recovery zone two and then I'd go up into zone three for a minute, like just this wave workout and towards the end it just got like stupid readings like 60 70 beats per minute when i'm pedaling very hard and then you know a really high reading so i experienced that so i will give a a strike for garmin in that i do have a chest strap i just wasn't using it i guess i will start using that more frequently but on runs it seems perfectly accurate but when you're not moving some for some reason it doesn't work very well so that's my update on Garmin in mile time. That's all I have. Uh, Feedy, do we need to go back to your updates? Uh, I think we need to talk about your plate jump. Yeah, what do you want to know? <laughs> I want to I want to just make it clear that I had the record for like two hours on this thing. And yeah. then Jared came in with his PF flyers and yeah. <laughs> beat me by like an inch and three quarters. Yeah, so I, I think I should have never thrown down the gauntlet in the first place there on the... Probably. Because you were like you were good at 12 because you were so much further than the competitor standard of nine inches that you're just like, all right, I'm good. I should have been like, wow, that's impressive. Good job. And then, and then you said 15 inches and I was like, no, you, and you thought 18 and whatever was like untouchable. I know well, that. no, no, <laughs> to be clear, to be clear, 18 and, and like three quarters or whatever it was, I was just like, ah, this is good enough. I don't care anymore. I've I've been play jumping for like 35 minutes and I'm just done. You know, what's funny about that is the, the only two tests I did one day of the week, it was a plate jump and broad jump. I just saved those for a specific day. And I think I trained for 70 minutes. Yeah. Two two jumping tests. Yeah. Because of you, (laughs) like I should have, I should have been able to execute that in like 10 minutes, but like I kept like, I didn't know what you jumped. So I just kept jumping 70 minutes. Anyway, yeah, I jumped for way too long. So, and now we've probably talked about jumping for way too long. Yes, I hit four inches, and I was like, "Okay, I'm good. Bye." <laughs> like, yeah, those of us who are human beings, <laughs> you know, that is untouchable. You know? Well, it just depends on where you yeah. measure from. If you didn't jump high enough, measure from a different place. At an angle helps. At oh an angle, gosh. downhill. Yeah. All right, let's get into the study. It is. A systematic review and meta-analysis. So that's important to know right off the bat. The name of the study is Effects of Gradual Weight Loss versus Rapid Weight Loss on Body Composition and RMR. What they were looking at, again, these reviews, they, they are looking at a lot of different study, a lot of different participants. So they study studies they, to try and come to some sort of conclusion. So everybody's ears should perk up when you hear that because these are a little bit more robust typically than like a study of seven individuals to that came to a conclusion. All in all, this was seven studies they looked at. They had 167 participants who met the criteria of slower weight loss 
um, and 194 who met the criteria of faster and more rapid weight loss. The range was quite, quite ridiculous. The age range, it was 18 to 70 years old. Everyone's BMI was either overweight or, or obese. There could be no exercise component in this. So it all had to be uh, like diet related. And lastly, Ashley, 75% females were studied. I don't know. I don't think that was intentional. I just think that's what came up. Uh, so anyway, we are talking gradual versus rapid weight loss. Which one is, is good or bad? I guess I could just kind of start with the conclusion, get that out of the way, and then we can talk about any of the, the details. But ultimately, they found that gradual had a greater reduction in fat mass, a greater reduction in body fat percentage, and preserved RMR over rapid weight loss. And gradual was less than or equal to 0.5% of your body weight per week, and rapid was 1% to 1.5% of your body weight per week. And that is all I have to say for now. What do you guys have? So I guess I'll start by saying that the after you hear the conclusion for the faster weight loss, it seemed to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but after reading this, it looked like they just basically put the faster weight loss people on it, just a higher caloric deficit. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Right? So, yeah. They, so for me, all I kept thinking was, how hungry were these people? <laughs> like I... I was wondering, like, were they getting enough of the food that they actually needed, you know, or were these people just kind of starving the entire time and they, that's how they lost weight faster, which to me is not right. You should, you know, if, when you're trying to lose weight, yes, you can put yourself in a little bit of a caloric deficit, but just not to that extreme. And then in my personal opinion, I think the slower weight loss, it's better because you're going to hopefully use these habits and use them later on and continue on. Like this should be something that is a lifetime thing, not something that is, I want to lose 25 pounds right now. And I understand that a lot of people want to see fast results. I mean, that's just the American culture, right? We want it. We want things right now and we want to do it, you know, the easy button, easy way. But I think that the slower gradual weight loss is, I mean, it showed on the charts exactly what you're talking about. Like the resting metabolic rate was better. Like it's just better for your body in general. So that's what I took away from this. Yeah, and so I think on this one too, like when we when we say short term uh, weight loss intervention, we're talking anywhere from five to twelve weeks, and then for the the long slow intervention, we're talking nine to thirty six weeks. So in GGA terms, we're talking one cycle versus three cycles, right? So if you're if you're trying to lose weight in one cycle, that you can see how that will be a very aggressive diet plan, and because they're not working out, there's a lot of other side effects that come along with that. So like we talked about in a previous podcast, I think two weeks ago, if you're not strength training, you're probably losing some muscle mass in there. So if you're going to be this aggressive, you need to be weight training as well, which means if you're not, you should probably take the path of slow and do this over 36 weeks, i.e. three cycles, and really uh, kind of limit how much fat-free mass you're losing. And it talks about that in the study here as well. In addition to possible metabolic damage, if you get too aggressive early on. So, and we got to realize like when they were talking about these subjects, these, you know, 300 or so subjects that they were reviewing, these are not in shape people. These were overweight or obese people. So they probably don't have good nutrition habits from the start. And so when you're really aggressive in the beginning, that's what they're going to learn first. It's called recency when you're learning. And so the recency of this type of aggressive intervention is going to teach them bad habits. And so that could be a possible reason why they were not successful in the long term after uh, the intervention. So just something to be aware of, something I want to put out there uh, as far as what we're talking about when we say fast and slow. Yeah. And something on the 
one more thing I kind of missed in the, in the results. So gradual had greater re- reduction in fat mass, greater reduction, reduction in body fat percentages and preserved RMR better. But then there was no significant difference in body measurements. So waist to hip ratio, all these things. So the measurements weren't different between people, but that in measurements is something that people care a lot about fitting into your clothes differently and everything. So we had a, a conversation before the podcast about the the human element to all this. Me and VD, we kind of discussed like, you know, because we, we were going back and forth on like there, you know, VD, you were saying that there is some factor of wanting that quicker reduction, maybe helping people stick to something, you know, especially people who aren't trained, who don't, you know, it's hard for the anyone who's severely obese to connect this really long-term mindset if they have really poor habits to, to success. Uh, so I definitely see the argument for wanting to lose weight quicker. Like my, my dad just lost, I don't even know how much weight it is. It was an incredible amount. Um, like I, it's gotta be close to like a hundred pounds or something. And he did it through an aggressive juice fast, like super aggressive juice fast for like 45 days or something. You know, he barely, he was barely eating any calories. He's done this one, one other time though. And he gained it all back. You know, Mm -hmm. and this time he's doing pretty well because he has a really solid. And this is what I talked to him about over and over again. I was like, yeah, this is great. You're losing absurd amounts of weight. Awesome. But like, we need to talk about your plan after because you can't just be on a juice fast forever. And he has a pretty decent plan. He's doing a good job now. So I think that that has to be factored in if you want to go this rapid weight loss. But I think the the missing piece of this and something that's not covered in the study is what is the deal with this RMR? Like, why does it, why is preservation of your RMR a good thing when you lose weight slowly? And that's because you, you're kind of jacking up your, your metabolic system. If you lose weight really fast, your RMR, uh, isn't going to, isn't going to catch up. It's going to slow down. And so when it slows down, you're not burning as much weight and RMR can account for, you know, 70% of your total calories you burn in a day. So if it's not burning as many calories as it should, because if you think about exercise, Emily and I had a conversation about this this week. Like if you want to gain or lose weight, nutrition is the lever that you pull, but exercise, it might, it helps your body function. There are a lot of great benefits to it, especially performance-based like what we're doing. But if you think about it, any given training session, maybe you burn 300, 400 calories. Like that is not enough of a, of a caloric deficit from uh, or burn to make you start losing significant amounts of weight. It has to be a nutrition lever that's pulled to start losing, losing weight when you exercise. So this RMR is super important, super important. So if your RMR gets uh, jacked up or just your metabolism gets jacked up because you lost weight so fast, that's why you yo-yo back so quickly. And I think that's the biggest point that needs to be seen here is if you want long-term results, you need to go at it slow. But then we also talked about before the podcast, that doesn't sell, right? It's like, hey, you need to try really hard for a very long time. The results will be very minimal, but it's going to be better for you. It's like getting a four-year-old to eat vegetables or getting garage gym athletes to do zone two. It's very hard. (laughs) You You have to really make sure people know why before they'll start to get bought in and actually do the thing that's really good for them. So that's yeah, and, for, and for the non-nerds out there, RMR is resting metabolic rate. That means like when you're just sitting on your couch doing whatever you do during the day, the rate at which your body metabolizes energy. So how many calories you're using just being alive, right? And so that's what RMR is. And going back to the study a little bit here, the fat-free mass is what generates that RMR. So the more muscle mass you have, the more metabolically active pieces of your body that you have, the more energy you're going to burn. So it's very, very important that your fat-free mass level is as high as you can get it because you're going to burn more at rest just from having more lean mass. And so that's one of the things that they talked about being on the fast weight loss track is that your RMR is going to drop. So you're going to burn fewer calories with a lower fat-free mass than you would if you took a long slower intervention process to to losing that weight yeah with the with the slow they they maintained more muscle mass but also for those people who want to keep the muscle keep their strength the slow way is the better to go and because of your resting metabolic rate and to kind of circle back from a study what two or three weeks ago when we talked about strength training with weight loss is that keeping the strength training with weight loss will also help 
keep that, maintain that, that muscle mass. Another note that I wanted to point out on, on the lighter side is that this had a forest plot and VD educated us on how to read <laughs> said forest plot. So we are all versed in the reading of forest plots. So you cannot question our val- valid reading of this, of this. I just wanted to put that out there that we know how to read a forest plot somewhat. I just want to put it out there okay. that forest plots are easy to read. <laughs> yeah, they are. They, I mean, they really are. If you just look at one. So this is all in reference to who was it? Wilkes and Cresser, right on the Rogan yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. He like mm-hmm. he demolished him because he didn't know how to read a forest plot. But I bet if you showed Cresser a forest plot and just gave him sixty seconds to try and figure it out, he would have got it. You know, <laughs> the fact that he had never seen one before is, is a little weird to me. But I feel like they're. And th- this is more like how, like how, why did Chris or, Chris or not know this? He should have just been like, yeah, dude, I know how to read a forest plot and then looked at it and be like, yeah, I can figure it out. So I think, I think he knows. I think he knew. He just, it was a bad debate. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He made a mistake. Yeah. But uh, the, back to the actual study, what they actually, what the other thing they found was that a, the fast group, the ones who were trying to lose it fast, they also had a reduction in testosterone and messing with hormones I, is something that is always really bad to do if you do things that jack with your hormones because that's something that can have lasting effects, things that are hard to reverse, and something that you actually don't know if it's happening until you really get a test or if you really feel severe side effects from it. So I, I don't like anything that jacks with hormones, and if reducing testosterone is not a good one because that's also going to help you either put on muscle or burn some fat as well. And, and that was... Go ahead. Sorry. That was all the way around, right, Joe? Like that was females and males. Yes. I don't think so, they segregated. I didn't break I didn't go down to like the specific study that looked at that, but the females were the large majority of their groups that they took. So mm-hmm. yeah. And being estrogen dominant can also be a, like we could talk about <clears throat> that for forever. Like it's it's crazy. So yeah, hormonal imbalances in females are very qu- common. And so if you're gonna do something to like make it even worse, like that's, that's not what you want. It's not what you're going to go for. And in, in fact, it actually might be to your detriment, even if you're losing weight now. Well, it's interesting. If you look at the two, two studies we have covered recently on weight loss is the, the hormonal thing, but just weight loss in general is bad. You know, it's, it's good to lose weight, but this catabolic process of losing weight seems to be bad for your body because it affects your muscle protein synthesis, muscle protein breakdown, and all of these other hormonal factors being catabolic seems to be a negative thing for your body. All right. So moral of the story on weight loss, it's better to do it slowly if you want to be healthy. (laughs) That's all I got. Now we're going to cover a book. It was the book of the month that we announced nowhere and the points don't mean anything. So <laughs> the 21 the laws I've created on, the, on our Instagram, 21 laws of leadership by uh, Maxwell, John C. Maxwell. Um, irrefutable. Irrefutable laws of leadership. And we're going to let Kyle go first. Cause we just skipped over him on the study um, <laughs> and stole all of his points. So uh, Kyle, what do you have to say on this book? So I, this was this was different for me, which was written by a guy who you know was was a pastor, and so it was a little bit a little bit different for me coming from ministry as well. But the things that stuck out to me in the book were things that I remember from my time in ministry. So seven years of full time ministry, and the things that stuck out to me, the laws that stuck out to me anyway were uh, the first one was the law of addition, and so he's talking in in there about the law of addition is all about your goal as a leader being adding to someone else. So adding value to someone else's work or adding value to someone else's life instead of seeking to gain something from that person. And so always as a leader, looking at your people and saying, how can I add value to these people as their leader? And so that was something that, I, that, that really stuck out to me as well. But the other one was the law of connection. And so that's exactly how it sounds like you need to have connections, strong personal connections to the people that you're leading. And to me, these two kind of go hand in hand. And, and that's, that was my experience. 
in ministry as well was the law of addition and the law of connection going hand in hand. And, and the law, you can use the law of addition to make connections, right? Of, of going and saying, how can I help you? How can I add to what you're doing? How can I add to add value to your life and to your work? And that makes a connection with other people. I know as, as followers, we all have people that we're following. And when the people that we're following do that to us, you know, it makes us feel really good and it makes us feel valued and it makes us feel important. So those are things that that stuck out to me, but that's also, you know, that's kind of the model of ministry leadership anyway, is considering other people more important than yourself. You know, that's a biblical principle. And so that's just, I guess that's kind of why it stuck out to me, but I just, I've just, all the people that I've known that are great leaders, all the people that I've followed that were great leaders, they did these two things. You know, they, they sought to add to other people and they made sure that they had strong personal connections with the people that they were leading. Ashley? Law, so I really liked this book and I'll just stick, I have three laws that I really loved. When we did my grad gym athlete interview and we talked about being a better human one of my things was always learn like don't think that you learned everything and so i loved law three because it's called law of the process and he just talks about as a leader that you need to continue your learning that you're not just because you're kind of at the top as a leader you didn't learn everything there is to know so and i like his little quote he talks about like what is a little thing that you could a positive thing to impact your life your business your employees and then you know what is something that you could potentially stop doing that could have a big impact as well so law 3 was uh, stuck out to me as well as law 6 cuz it talks about the character of a person and it talks about how trust trust and character go hand in hand, right? So if you are authentic and you also just lead by, you know, how you live, that's also a huge, I think a great quality in a leader. Also just being transparent and kind of, you know, saying I struggle with this too as, you know, and here's how I can help you and whatnot. So just a person's character is going to show you if they're a good leader or not. And then lastly, law, I think it's 17. Yeah, 17. And the reason I love this is I'm a planner. I love to plan things out and I have to do this in order to get things done. And he talks about you with this law that you basically make sure that you're getting the important things done, that you're not just kind of like a chicken with your head cut off, just going everywhere and not getting actual stuff done, that you're actually, you know, accomplishing the goals and the tasks that you need done, you know, whether it be in the workplace or in your life or whatnot. And that's just something that I like to adhere to as well. You know, what are the important things that I have to get done today? So that way I can move on with whatever I have to move on with tomorrow or whatnot. So those were the three laws that I really liked in this book. I'll just start, first off by saying that this book is, if you're interested in it, uh, it's really short. It's only like three and a half hours on Audible. And if you listen at accelerated speed, you can knock that out in, you know, probably one day, of, one two, two days of commuting if you do that. So it would be good to get. But the law that I, that I really like that I wrote down was the law of the inner circle. And I like this one because it's all about who you surround yourself with and how you and, and how you you're not going to succeed on your own, but it's going to be who, who's around you. And everybody has flaws. Everybody has strengths and somebody else is going to have different strengths and different flaws than you. So balancing that out, having people balance you out and either pushing you or throttling you or whatever it is to be in your inner circle, I think is, is really important because it's also not, you're, you're never going to do anything alone. So you're going to need people that can either pick up your slack or help you, your shortcomings or anything like that. And, you know, even like us six are completely different, but I think it's, it's all, you know, flaws and flaws and uh, strengths all balance each other out. And I also pulled out a quote that I think is kind of touches on Kyle's part. And that was, he said to always touch a person's heart before you ask for a hand. And I really like that because it's, it's something that I've, I've noticed that a lot of good leaders do and bad leaders don't. And that's ones that they, when they, when they go to see you, you know, they're a good leader because they're going to offer you, they're going to help their team, their people under them succeed and bring them up. 
and do something for them first before they start telling them stuff of what to do. And you see that in the military a lot. And it's pretty clear right away that, you know, there's going to be authoritarian leaders that are just directing people and telling you what to do. And then there's also ones that are going to ask you what you, what, what you need so that you can succeed. So what they get, they can do for you, because that's a direct, it's a direct reflection on them if their people are succeeding as well. So I like the book. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Recommend it. So what I really wanted to say was one of the major themes I have been debating since I was in college in ROTC and still continue to debate this day, are, be, are, are leaders born or are they made? And one of the themes of the book basically stating, you can learn to be a great leader. You can do all this stuff. And I disagree with that to some extent. I do think great leaders are born. I think everything else is trainable and that you can make yourself the best version of a leader that you can be. But all of the examples he uses in the book of these phenomenal leaders did not train themselves to be leaders. They weren't reading someone else's book to try and become a good leader, you know, and that doesn't mean they're great. And so I disagree with that. And I've had this, like I said, I have this debate. I'm not saying I'm right either. Uh, I, I mean, I've had colonels just straight disagree with me and tell me why I'm wrong. And I'm like, uh, you didn't change my opinion. Like I still think, I think you can make really phenomenal managers by having this 21 point checklist. Uh, but I still don't think, and he kind of, did, and the reason I feel like it contradicts is because it's law like number, where is it? Like five, it says leaders become real leaders thanks to their character, relationships, knowledge, experience, past successes, and abilities. People will not follow you because of your position. That's true. You can't just have a rank in the military and assume you're a leader, but think about how hard it is to cultivate all those other things, your character, your relationships, your knowledge, your experience, your past successes and abilities. You're not going to pick up a book and then get all those things done. So I disagree with this fundamental principle that you're not born. I think that you, I think great leaders are born to some degree. And I just think that's shown historically. And I'm not saying if you're not born this amazing leader, then you're screwed. You can, like I said, everything is trainable. You can train all of these great traits. And I agree with a lot of the ones that he put down here, but I think that a lot of be leadership is intuitive and then the rest of it has to be worked on. And I think a lot of it is kind of like what Ashley was saying. It's like just this continual learning. Like if you just are always willing to learn and grow, that's going to make you a pretty good leader. And that's what I, and I feel like that is the fundamental success of all the great leaders that he does use in the book is that they're just continually learning and making themselves better. And then my favorite one is the law of victory is basically be a sore loser. Like you, you need to win at all costs. And I just think that that's a good one because you know, the, the humility has a place, but if you're so humble that you're afraid to chase your goals or afraid to admit what you actually want in life, I don't think it's going to take you very far. No one else is going to be motivated by what you have to say. So I think humble, being humble is good, but being humble to a fault is also dangerous. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword with humility. That's it. I think it's a great, great book. I like most of Maxwell's work in general. So it's a good one. V, do you have anything to say on leadership in general? I do in general. So in general, I didn't read this book. So I'll be honest on that, but I'll tell you this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> literally, I did not read this book, but I'll tell you this when it comes to leaders, you have leaders who lead, and then those who kind of don't, right? So uh, kind of goes to your point, Jared, you have people that are in positions of power, in positions of influence, but I wouldn't necessarily call that leaders. I would call that a job. And for those that think they don't lead, you actually probably could have people that look up to you, follow you without you knowing it. So all of us, you know, on this podcast, whether we know it or not, people are looking at us following what we do, and we may not even know that. And that goes for all the listeners too. So think about what you do at your job for those that work for you, under you, next to you. Those folks could be following you and following your influence, whether you know it or not. So using Ashley's point and saying, uh, be the change you want to see, I think that's the biggest thing you can think of. Do the things that you would want your children to do whether you have them or not. I think that's probably the best way to lead, even if you're not in a position of power. And so I would only add that 
you know, law 22 says don't suck. And that's what I would probably add to the book had I read it. It definitely was missing that one. Yeah. Well, don't law suck. number 23, try harder. <laughs> Do more. Yeah. Uh, rule number that? 76, no excuses, play like a champion. I just want to add that. Yeah. We don't even cover the workout. Let's talk so, about some fat and sugar. Yeah. So uh, just because I mentioned it in the last podcast, I really wanted fat and sugar to, to pop up. So here we are with fat and sugar. I have it pulled up unless anyone else would like to brief it. Go for it. All right. So this one is kind of complicated. So what you're going to do is repeat the following circuit, eight minutes of zone two, run, bike, or walk at 60 to 70% of your max heart rate. That's zone two. And then two minutes of zone four or greater of uh, burpee pull-ups. And so you are going to be doing burpee pull-ups until 100 burpee pull-ups have been accumulated. So you're going to do this eight and two until you get to 100 burpee pull-ups. And if you are a competitor, you will wear a vest. Then you have five minute recovery period during that uh, period. So you've achieved the 100 burpee pull-ups. You tally up how many minutes you spent outside of zone two, four, or five, AKA time spent in zone one or three. And for every one minute spent in zone one or zone three, complete 10 burpees up to a 100 burpee cap. It's so kind of a complicated one, not actually that complicated when you're doing it. If you have a heart rate monitor of any sort, tallying up how much time you spend in these different zones is very, very simple. But if you don't, there is a non heart rate monitor version, which is eight minutes, low intensity, run, bike, walk, two minutes, high intensity, or as fast as possible, burpee pull-ups until hundred burpee pull-ups have been accumulated. You wear a vest of your competitor, five minute recovery period, and then complete 100 burpees. So you have to do the hundred burpee cap. If you don't have it, it was like, we punish you for not having a heart rate monitor. <laughs> All right. Tips, oh, we really love you. Wind up having to do that anyway, because the Fitbit is terrible. Yeah. Not yes. Not a sponsor. <laughs> Obviously, not a sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> I hope we get a sponsor, and that's how we start. Fitbit <laughs> has decided to sponsor this podcast. They're absolutely horrible, but we have to mention them because they're a sponsor. <laughs> All right. What do you guys have? Uh, tips, tricks on on this one. Joe's still sour that we changed it from it's so a form. I did the beta version. I actually was proactive. This is one of those times where we had a meter stuff Saturday and there was a beta version. And I was like, yeah, I'm doing it. And I did it. And I was the first one to do it. And then it was like, yeah, well, guess what? We changed it. So <laughs> it sucks I think to they you. changed it like three times. Yeah. So yeah. you've never actually done it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was basically like uh, Marco just kicked, Marco joined the chat and was basically like, hmm, how about burpee pull ups? I'm like, hmm, I didn't see this. So I'm just going to do the first version. <laughs> Why was I late to the Slack chat? Yeah, which I preferred. It actually takes longer time-wise, but it's just straight running. Also, for those of you who weren't keeping track, it goes from zone two to zone four, and there's a zone in the middle called zone three that you can pass <laughs> through. So, so it's impossible <laughs> so to go from two to four. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you're in a way set up for failure. This is the one where I called them penalty burpees, and Jared said there weren't penalties, but they're penalty burpees, basically. So they're just I my call them the same account. thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so that was that was going to be one of my points was like you will have burpees at the end because of zone three. Zone three will give you burpees. So just accept the fact that at the end of this, you're going to have some burpees to do. Well, will you though? Because it's a minute. It's not every second spent. Do you think you could go from zone two to zone four in less than 60 seconds? Yeah, but then the problem know. is... You can with an electric shock. Or just stay in zone four the there whole time. There you go. Get some, get some electrodes so near you. So just stick a screwdriver in an outlet and you're up to zone four. Oh my you're gosh. Hard. Okay, hey, hey, everyone. I was kidding, all right? <laughs> Don't electrocute Write yourself under any down. circumstance. Uh, yeah, so... I think it's it's possible. I've done this workout one time. I didn't do it. So Kyle, you're probably right. But I, I want to see if someone can do it. If they can quickly get through zone two to zone four without any of these extra burpees that make you better, not penalty burpees. Just take your monitor off. Impressive. <laughs> Just take your monitor off. <laughs> take your monitor off from zone two. And then when you feel like you're in zone four, put it back on and there you go. So... No, if you're not cheating. You're not that. Also either. known as cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure your vest is strapped down. If you have a vest, I hit the back of my head multiple times doing burpee pull-ups the first round. That hurt, mm. and then had to tighten it. So, just pro mm -hmm. tip on that one. Yeah, so tighten for the burpees, and then loosen up a little bit for the run to get some airflow. 
Yeah, I, it wasn't really a run for me. It was more like a shuffle to stay oh, in zone nice. two. <laughs> but my thing is zone three, sure, but it was like zone five. My heart rate just gets jacked. So, yeah. I mean, mm. burpees do that. So that's that's the thing. You have to find that pace where you're going to stay consistent in zone four. And You can I do know it greater. Maybe zone four or five on the burpees. Oh, I thought you can't hit zone five. No, oh, five's, you, five's okay. Five's okay. Oh. You can't. One and three are the bad ones. Yeah. I will bow out now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think also you don't have to wear the vest on the run. Wait. Yeah, that's right. Because it was, uh, we were talking about before that it was just like taking too much energy to, I don't know what it was, but I remember that debate. The Ruby Pulps only has the vest. The zone two is doesn't, but it was just like, well, I'm not going to take this off and put it back on each time. Yeah. So. Which is right. why I shuffled. I just kept the vest on. It's, but, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if we've been helpful, listeners, but uh, <laughs> go try it out. Um, see if you can figure this workout out, and good luck. But no, seriously, anybody have anything else? It's a fun one. BD, just do it. Just have, do it. Just do it. Just go faster. Yeah. If you want, if you want my version, the beta version, then just let me know. Yeah. <laughs> Send your <laughs> message. Unofficial. And yeah, I mean, there's, there's really no tricks to this one. There's really no tricks to this one. It's just doing it. Yeah. And and good luck. All right. That's it for today's podcast. Hitting PRs all around today. And we just had a bunch of PRs in our Facebook group, which was phenomenal. So we just finished uh, Fit Week. We're officially into the new cycle at Garage Gym Athlete. Always a good time to join. If you are thinking about it, you can start a 14-day free trial at garagegymathlete.com. For all of our athletes hitting this new cycle, stay consistent, finish this 12-week cycle out strong. It gets a little bit challenging. Cycle four is always a little challenging because you have uh, November, there's Thanksgiving in there, December, there's travel. Start uh, you know, formulating those plans now. One of the big things that helps me when I'm trying to achieve a goal is not just stating what the goal is going to be, but writing down what's going to F me up. You know, what is going to screw me up? Is it going to be travel? Is it going to be this trip? Is it going to be, and then formulating a plan for those things. So that's my, my tidbit for all of our athletes going into this last cycle of 2020. And for anyone else who wants to be on the cycle, garagemathlete.com. That's it. For and this oh. if... Piggybacking on, piggybacking on leadership. If you would like something on mental toughness, work on your mental toughness, check out our Instagram. There'll be links in the story this week on uh, mental toughness things we got. Yes, and we, we should mention at the beginning too. Dang. All right, good. That's it. Thanks for listening to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Thanks for listening.